thanks to, to William, thanks to Greg, thanks to the uh, Manco Foundation for, for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to talk to this group. I was here last year and I really enjoyed the, the interaction. So I hope that we're going to have um, stimulate some discussion and I'll try to keep my presentation reasonably brief so that um, we can have time for, um, for questions and, and discussion. Um, what's going on here? Okay, so I was invited by, by William to talk about um, sports as a, a lens through which to look at the special case of Australia. And you might think, well, you know, why? Why sports? What about that? Well, partly it's because when we look at Australian society, you know, sports obviously seem to have a lot, play a large role in our society. Um, Sports are very popular. You know, the last survey we have from the, the ABS estimated that almost half, 43% of Australians over 15 had been a spectator at a sporting event during the previous year, in 2010. Um, the most popular sports, as spectator sports, are the AFL, horse racing, rugby league, most, let me see the list there, I don't really need to read it out. Probably the team sports are the ones with the most people watching in the sense of you know, the 43% the is individuals. Well, people going to AFL probably got a more than one game in a season. So in terms of repeat um, attendance, it's the team sports, in particular AFL and rugby league, that are, are the, at the peak of this. And the second point to emphasize is that this really is big business. And it's not um, you know, people playing in the backyard. We're talking here about um, the AFL generating revenues, probably about a billion dollars. You know, we're not too sure, I and mean, this is one of the, the themes of my talk, because the accounts are very non-transparent. Um, but we know that there have been, for example, very large TV deals for the AFL and for, for the Rugby League. And we know that among Australian sports players, there are at least 50 of them earned over a million dollars a year. Um, in 2013. So we talk about something that, that is big business, it's not just a game. You know, money and sports have a, a very long association in Australia. If we look back into the late 19th century, in 1880 the Melbourne Cup attracted 100,000 spectators. There were regular circuits for prize fighters who toured between Britain and the United States and Australia. And, you know, the, these are important antecedents in the sense that you know, Australia is in there with Britain and the United States. It's where money and sports first start to come together in a big way. If we talk about the industrial characteristics of sports, in all of those three countries, you know, it clearly has the same starting date, the second half of the 19th century. Why? Because that's when the benefits of the Industrial Revolution you know, start to be felt by the working class, the hours work start to decline towards the 40 hours so that men have, um, importantly, Saturday afternoon for leisure. And what do they do with their discretionary cash? They go to, um, to watch sports. And if we look at the, the start of the, the National League, American baseball, or you know, a bit of uncertainty here. Jeffrey Blaine is really the expert on the origins of Australian rules football. But you know, the transition from the Victoria Football Association to a, a bit more organized VFL is occurring in the same period. The VFL clearly the antecedent for, for the AFL. Or in England, the, the Football League in Soccer, established in, in 1888. These are already attracting fairly big crowds, and especially in Australia. You know, there are estimates that the, um, the, the final in 1886 between South Melbourne and Geelong attracted 34,000 people. It's probably the, the world's biggest crowd for a football game up to that time. You know, so Australia is, is well in the forefront of this professionalization of sports, you know, turning it into an industry you know, with substantial revenues. Um, Sydney following a little behind Melbourne, you know, which reflects the relative um, growth at, at the time. But already in the early start of the last century, you know, over 50,000 people are going to a rugby game in, in Sydney. So this is something that is big business. You know, and I want to emphasize that but also to emphasize you know, the difference in the industrial organization that happens in these three areas between the United States, England, and Australia. The big division in most of the discussion in sports economics is between the way the North American leagues are organized as closed cartels. There's a limited number of teams in the leagues. They 
clubs or the leagues decide if any new teams can come in, usually charging them entry fees, or they can, very exceptional circumstances, expel teams. But the point being that it's a closed group. You know exactly who's there. Limited who can participate in the quest for being the undisputed champion. Whereas in England, in the English Football League, the different feature is that you have promotion and relegation. If a team does badly, they'll get relegated to a lower division. If a team does well, they can get promoted. So there's more fluidity. If towns become more important, they like to have a club that moves up the, league, the divisions. Old towns will find the clubs move down. There's a lot of debate about that in the literature. I'm not really going to talk about that today. But the point I'd make here is that when we look at Australia, Australian leagues all follow the, the American model. So talk about you know, the British influence. You know, it's you know, it's um, not very clear in terms of its organization. You know, the organization is very clearly similar to the North American one. We have leagues that have a limited number of clubs in them. A new entry is restricted. It's determined by, by the league. Right? Um, and this is a bit peculiar because Clearly when we talk about the North American leagues, we can talk about what's happening there. It can be explained by private ownership and profit maximization. You create a, a, a close cartel, you make it de, um, excess demand for places, you can play off potential whole cities and so on. Now, that's not the argument that's going on, on in Aus Australia. You know, we have leagues that are um, um, clubs that are members owned for the most part. And so what's going on there? How can we explain that? Before I try to give an explanation, I'll give you one other piece of background to this. When we see the evolution of professional sports in the 20th century, they don't change very much. You know, recognizably, the rules, you know, the, um, the live event doesn't change much, but what does change is the audience. First of all, through radio, uh, um, which brings the sporting events to a lot bigger audience, but particularly TV. Um, spreads after 1945 in the United States, in Australia, a bit later, really 1975, is when we start to have better quality um, transmission in TV. And also, what is clear in Australia as a distinctive feature was the dominant role of the public broadcaster, which was challenged by Kerry Packer in the 1970s in <coughs> terms of, of cricket. Um, and also, there's a challenge in terms of competitive bidding for TV rights in the rugby league context in the 1990s. But, you know, so what's happening here is the revenues coming into the sports are increasing tremendously. The last five-year TV contract in rugby league and in AFL is over a billion dollars. You know, so big money coming because you've got this much larger audience, national audiences. Although you know, they're still following this pattern of a single league and it's so essentially a monopsonistic labor market. that The league is setting the terms under which um, players um, work and are paid. The other background feature I want to mention is the public policy towards professional sports. And we see, you know, I think we can separate that to two very different ways in which governments react. You know, the first two, you know, these are monopolies, the cartels. You know, we have a competition policy in Australia. It's virtually never applied to sports. Right? It, it, the fact that it's a natural monopoly because we want a champion could say, well, there may be um, some caveats in how you apply the competition policy. The clear outcome, though, is just a non-application, which is even more in the labor market. You know, there's no government intervention, although there are you know, fairly clear restraints of trade. You know, the, the draft, the salary cap, you know, we wouldn't accept that. In universities, and if you're going to do a PhD, and you're the best PhD in Australia, you know, would you accept that when you finish your PhD, you're sent to the worst university? whether you want to live in Darwin or wherever the worst university is. Yeah. There's no choice, right? Yeah. You've got to go there. Yeah. Um, when we look at the salary caps, yeah, yeah, which industry, you know, if another industry said we're going to restrict competition by you know, all agreeing the maximum we'll pay our employees, that would be against the competition policy. It's allowed in sports. Um, another feature for labor market is this um, very, um, strong attempt to avoid any recourse to, to the, the civil um, legal procedures uh, so that you know, if um, players at say an AFL club that's got red and black colors are used as guinea pigs for medical experiments, you know, they cannot complain under the um, occupational health and safety measures. Uh, um, if a, a player is, is, suffers 
um, grievous bodily harm. You, know, you don't go to the courts. So all of these things, in terms of the labour markets, the competition policy, they're virtually um, kept outside of the normal procedures. On the other extreme, when we look at public spending, you know, the subsidies that go for sports are very large. If you think of the economics of professional sports, you know, very, very straightforward. You, know, you get together a few dozen players, put a few sticks up to make goals, you've got a ball, you enclose a stadium, and you charge people to go in. Right? It really can't help but make a profit, you think. And yet what we, we see is that the major sports you turn to the government for their major capital asset, the stadium. So in Adelaide, we've just spent $650 million on a new stadium, partly because Brisbane had done it earlier, and the next step is that Perth needs to have a stadium that's even better. You've got to have Wi-Fi on every seat in Perth, be better than Adelaide. <laughs> the basic question that's never asked is, you know, why is the public paying for these facilities, which are primarily used, and there are you know, uh, lesser examples in places like Manly or Geelong, of the governments, you're paying for the, the main facility for an industry that is a, quite a wealthy industry. So these I think, are things that are difficult to, to try to explain you know, why, they, why they happen. Um, you know, in terms of the exclusion from uh, uh, government regulation, I mean, I've got a couple of quotes here. One is, um, of course, it was in The Economist, so it was contrasting the, the strange outcome that when we look at the, this contrast between the closed cartel and promotion and relegation system, we tend to think of the United States as being more free enterprise, more dynamic, England being much more tradition-bound, hide-bound. And yet, in sports, we get the opposite. The American um, professional sports are, are very um, highly regulated and subsidized. Yeah. English football developed into a global business that is very, very competitive. Where does Australia fit into this? I mentioned that Australia followed the American pattern. Yeah. The general assessment is that the, the AFL is probably the most regulated sporting league in the world. Now, this is a, a quote from two um, people who work on, on the, the legal side of sport at the University of Queensland. Yeah? And it's justified in this um, explanation of fairness to create a more even competition, but the, um, the implementation is that you have a you know, very highly regulated um, league. And you know, we've seen some of these features. And yet, yesterday, I, mean, I flew from Adelaide, you've got three hours on the plane, I was reading the Australian in more detail than I usually do. There are two long stories about what's happening in Australian sports. You know, one of them was about the AFL, the two high-profile cases where people were suspended for six months. Um, you know, one, um, uh, Trigg, who had been at the Adelaide Crows, was suspended for six months because he'd been part of um, a exceeding the salary cap and dodging some of the draft regulations um, to bring Tippett to, a to Adelaide. The other was Heard, the coach of Essendon, who'd been suspended for his part in the performance enhancing drugs. And you know, the clear um, emphasis in, in the Australian was that Trick's crime, they both got six months suspension, Trick's crime was much worse. Yeah, he was lucky to still be in the AFL family. And so what had he done? He challenged you know, the draft and the salary cap that are fundamental to the fairness of the AFL. Um, Heard you know, shouldn't really be rushing back when his um, suspension ends next month, but not because he's done anything hugely wrong, because Essendon are actually doing really well this year and he might upset them by coming back. <laughs> so we've got a team that, that well, the worst drug um, scandal in AFL history, and the next year they're, they're up there still going for the playoffs. You know, so it's, you know, the, what, what matters there, it seems, is this ability to self-regulate the industry. Yeah. And at a very centralized level, you know, see, um, the AFL is controlling you know, how players are allocated and under what conditions. We see the second story, as I was, this has been a little more difficult in the rugby league. You know, the players actually challenged the draft in rugby league successfully in the courts. You know, so it's amazing that a court ruling that said the draft was inhuman and something close to serfdom, according to the judge, you know, still exists 20 years later in the, in the ever major team sport. But also we see this you know, challenge by the, the rugby league is trying to ensure that decisions are centralized, to reduce the power of club chairman. That means the people who have actually brought money into the clubs. You know, so it's kind of, kind of centralized and not allow this power of, of the individuals, which I think is 
um, you know, touched on a lot of the things that William and Jonathan mentioned earlier. The um, final thing I want to mention as a, an influence before I try to draw some implications of this is that sports have become global activities. You know, last, um, last few weeks, you know, billions of people, literally billions of people around the world were watching the, the Soccer World Cup. The Olympic Games attracts um, large, large crowds like that. There's a distinction here then that some sports have, are global, like soccer, some are clearly not global, like AFL, and some are subject to strong global influence, so that the money in cricket, say, increased when the, the Indian Premier League was formed a few years ago. Um, rugby yeah. um, tended to be, rugby league was just played in a few countries when you had World Cups, so there were only three, three countries that really seriously challenged, but since the professionalization of rugby union in 1995, rugby has also become more of a, a global sport. So we've got an interesting comparison in Australia. We have four you know, popular codes of football here. We've got AFL, which is strictly national. We have rugby union, rugby league, which are to some extent international. And we have soccer, which is clearly global. And that clearly affects you know, what happens to individuals' incomes in, in, in a different sports. So if we look at our passed around. I probably didn't have enough copies because um, I, I didn't realize we'd have such a big audience. Um, so the numbers about you know, who are the Australian sports men and women who earn the biggest income? What do they do? Well, most of them are um, playing in the leagues where there's a lot of money. You know, so we see earners play basketball or baseball in the United States. One of the biggest groups is soccer players. You know, if you think of Australia's performance in the recent World Cup, that might be quite surprising, but, but we have 10 highly paid soccer players. They're all overseas. You know, one of them is a reserve goalkeeper for a club in, in England, which means he doesn't actually pay. He's, been, he's paid $2 million a year for not playing. He's just there as a backup. Right? <laughs> um, we have other sports that Australians are good at, golf, surfing, tennis, cycling, that, 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 that are, are in there. Australian cricketers are, are well paid. This wouldn't have been so true you know, five or ten years ago before the, the Indian Premier League. You know, so what, what are the characteristics of, of these um, sports where the high paid people are? Well, they're the ones that have the biggest audiences. So the marginal revenue product of the players is higher because more money in the sports, and that's in, um, in North America in European soccer. You know, it's not obvious that that should be true, that Australia should actually be where there's, there's not a lot of money. I mean, when a smaller population than the United States, obviously, tenth for population, less. But compared to England, it's only half the population. It's surprising that so many going overseas. There's also um, a lot of uh, high-paid sportsmen are, are in individual sports, um, such as golf and tennis. The reason for that is that these are sports that have become global, and they follow a pattern. So we see many industries that are globalized where there's a very steep gradient of income. Yeah. If you're the best player, gets a lot more in a tournament than the next best player to encourage um, greater effort. In the, the Tour de France, uh, um, the first place gets more than twice as much as the second place. You're very steep. So it means that the earnings are a bit erratic, potentially high, but erratic. Um, what, what can we say about the place where people earn their money in sport, well, out of these 50 highest earning Australian sports stars on that list, there are only two actually earn their living in Australia. And this, I'd argue, has a lot to do with the restrictions on the labour markets in Australia. Um, the Australian football codes, the AFL, Rugby League, you are very popular in terms of spectators and TV rights, but they're not passed on to, the revenues aren't passed on to the players. You know, the only rugby, pl rugby player on the list for 2013 plays in Japan. That's um, and quite striking. Um, Australia has um, 10 soccer players on the list. They all play overseas. Right? And so what we clearly see is a situation where the, the league is designed, the um, practices are designed to... Oh, um, although we revere tall poppies, the labor markets are designed so that you don't get big incomes in domestic sports. And I, I think that's, to me, a very striking outcome when we look at some of these facts. You know, that we talk about these practices, the draft for salary cap in terms of fairness, but 
you know, one of the clear outcomes is that they're trans transferring the rents that arise in, in sports away from the players. Um, what can we say about these degrees of control in Australian sports? You know, it's not just what happens within the sports. It's aided by public policy. You know, public policy you know, stands by and allows the leagues to exploit the players right, by restrictions on their ability to move between clubs or to bargain for their, their salaries. Partly that is um, excused in popular discussion by saying these people get paid a lot to do what many people would like to do for fun. But you know, the average player, not the top 10%, the average player in the AFL of rugby league is not particularly well paid. You know, um, in a global market, uh, oh, and the other thing that is very striking is the acquiescence of the players. You know, the players make very little attempt to, to challenge this, which I think is also part of the, the Zonderweg in terms of the workers accepting these restrictions. In a global market, you know, such regulation doesn't work. And I think this is a clear um, got lessons for the other industries in, in our economy. You know, in a global market, even though you replicate the closed cartel model, which is used in, to regulate the labor market in the AFL and to a lesser extent in the, the NRL, you know, in soccer that doesn't work. Um, the clubs have little power to regulate pay and working conditions because they're operating in a global market. So any soccer players will go to Europe or Japan or the Middle East, Russia, United States. Um, it's clearly a global market that functions very smoothly and clearly that hasn't been disastrous for the industry. You know, part of the reason why the soccer market works like that is because um, of legislation in Europe, in the European Union, that has um, declared many of the practices in Australia as being illegal, uh, applied to soccer. Um, rugby also operates in a global market, but much less so. But what we see is it, there has been a challenge to, to the rugby league because players can move between rugby league and rugby union, to a lesser extent AFL, you know, fairly, fairly easily. So, so we see this. We have a model that has led to considerable control of sports in Australia, that where there's been globalization, that control has been loosened, you know, but where there is a, a sport that is insulated from these global impacts, you know, AFL being the clear example, you know, we continue to see these um, regulations. So, and we also see, you know, very, very strongly, we see that the, um, the use of, of subsidies to support um, the, 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 the professional sports. Um, one of the things that struck to me about this, I mentioned earlier, you know, the interstate competition that I think is part of, characterizes many things in Australia as a way of justifying state governments um, taking action. But surprising is how little debate there's been in any of these states. So when in the 2010 election in, in South Australia there was discussion about how, whether to upgrade the existing oval or to build a new stadium. You know, the two parties got into a bidding war of who could spend more. You know, it wasn't saving public money, it's who would spend more. When some commentator said, why don't we have a hospital, in, new hospital instead of a stadium, the government said, hey, we'll have both. And we do, we've got a new hospital being built as well as a new stadium. <laughs> what is the, the point of these anecdotes? Well, partly to say, we have a real lack of transparency. You know, in economics, we talk about the opportunity cost of building the stadium. What is it? You know, there's very little informed discussion. There's very little um, transparency about what is the cost and what is the alternative use of that. And one of the, to me, one of the striking features in doing the research behind the book that William talked about is you know, there's a very substantial lack of transparency. You know, in Australia, we have freedom of information laws. If you try to find use those to find information about public spending on sports, you will nearly always be knocked back on the grounds of commercial sensitivity. You know, to me it's incredible that we can, that the government can use that to justify not explaining public money. The states have um, bodies that, that uh, review past expenditures when they're fairly substantial. There's a, they, there's a quote in the background paper at the back of the room that's got all the, the references for my presentation, 
for, again from South Australia, where the, the body was supposed to review a spending on upgrading football, Footy Park, the Amy Stadium, in the early 2000s. It's a very short report because they say, we cannot work out how much the government spent on this. It may have been $5 million, but it may have been $15 million. Now, this is the body supposed to be reviewing public spending after the event. Now, they could not work it out. A lot of the spending we have is, is deliberately hidden. Again, in South Australia, we have a, a cycle race of Tour Down Under where the, the Premier was paying two or three million dollars to Lance Armstrong um, to participate. We never really knew the amount, and it only really started to have some digging in to find out what it was you know, after Armstrong was disgraced. It's a very special case there. And so we have this large spending on stadiums, all of the evidence we have from economists, right? Um, who look at whether these subsidies are justified by their economic impact, which is what state governments usually do as a justification, is that that doesn't really hold true when we try to measure the, the costs and benefits. Um, there's a survey article by two American economists looking at the global literature, and say economists are often accused of not agreeing on things, Well, one thing they do agree on is that if you build a stadium, you cannot justify it by the economic impact. There may be non-economic reasons, you know, pride in the city and so on, but you cannot justify it by how many jobs are created and, and so forth. So, to what extent can we think of Australia as being special in this? Well, we, the self-image we have in Australia, uh, sports are very popular, sports stars are revered, it's one of the, the sectors of the economy where tall poppies are are welcomed, you know, the sports stars are, are, are treated with, um, with some respect. But when we see the financial rewards, you know, they are reduced by labor market practices that reduce the share of the industry's revenues. So one of the big questions I would ask, that I don't have a clear answer to because of its non-transparency, is where do the rents go? And it doesn't cost much to put on a sporting event. The stadium's paid for by the, by the taxpayer, you know, where do all these revenues go? Who gets them? You know, who's, it, who's it all for? Um, to some extent, these restrictions are justified by relating to fairness, so in, point in Jonathan's presentation. In sports, it's talked about being competitive balance, so that in the AFL, for example, every team must have its turn as a champion, even if you've just joined the league, within a couple of years, you've got to be able to be a champion. You know, is that essential? Is that fair? You know, again, we can look at elsewhere in the world, you know, your fans are not so much different in different countries. You know, in Europe, soccer fans are quite willing to have you know, same, the same champions you know, justified there on the grounds of we'd like to see the best teams, the best players coming together in a team that's good, even if a handful of teams keep winning. So you know, this fairness um, rationalization you know, is an explanation of something, but it's not one, it's one imposed from above rather than asking the fans whether that's what they want. And finally, as I mentioned before, you know, we should think of just how peculiar is this feature? You know, the, the draft is something, I said they, when there was a, a challenge in the courts by the rugby league, you know, the judge said this was more reminiscent of serfdom than a modern labor market. You know, why, does that, why is that tolerated and why is it continued? Um, so I'm leaving you with more questions than I have answers, but I do think when we look at professional sports, how they've evolved, they've evolved in ways that are very consistent with many of these ideas of the Australian special way, particularly in terms of the, the regulation, the non-transparency, you know, the difference between the rhetoric of fairness, the rhetoric of excellence, and how the, the players are, are actually treated. Uh, I don't necessarily have um, any uh, clear answers to those, but I would say, the public policy is really very strange. Right? So, a like, total absence of control of a major, an industry that's a you know, billion dollar industry, billion, no, where individual leagues are billion dollar um, enterprises, very little control over those. And on the other hand, your know, large amounts of money are spent on facilities and also on some other things. We see spending includes training of elite athletes. You know, if you look at that list of the, the top 50 um, highest paid sports stars, the 2012 list, I think it's eight out of the top 16, had the training at public expense of the Australian Institute of Sport. When most of you students have your training at a public expense, you have to pay it back under the HEC scheme. You pay back the cost of it, right? because you, um, especially if you start to make large incomes. When you look at the sports stars, these guys are making huge incomes. You know, these top 16 are making $2 million a year or more. They don't have to repay any of it. So this exceptionalism that's given to to sports, I guess, 
reflects a lot of things that are specific attitudes. We don't have the same attitudes in other countries. And similar, and you're more, they always claim to be in public benefits, but when we look at afterwards, after the event, it's very hard to find those benefits. Okay, um, we've got about 10 minutes, so let's uh, invite questions. Well, If you actually look at the income earned of the star of the Olympic athletes compared with that they earned a lot less than the administrators. <laughs> so uh, I kind of wonder, partly I think a lot of people aren't aware of that, but to the extent that Australians do love winning, um, I wonder whether that will bring pressure to see a bit of a change in that. And just as a in parenthesis, could I add that the regulation of academic academia in Australia has certainly contributed to the low salaries of academics. <laughs> Right. Okay, well, I'll buy that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a crucial question. Where do the rents go? I mean, they're going to, you know, administrators are very well paid in, in these professional team sports. You know, one wonders, you know, what exactly they do and how much skills do they really need? I mean, and, and it's not just their, actual, their salary. A lot of it is the perks as well. Uh, yeah. Is it possible part of the rents get a sports fan? Part of sport, they go to sports fans. They might, maybe they would be asked to pay more otherwise. Yeah. I mean, the big increase in revenue, so is TV. They pay a lot for those rights. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, I, just on the Australia. We wrote a paper a couple of years ago on this stadium. I mean, the Australian had a, a big headline saying, Time for the AFL to open up their accounts. <coughs> it hasn't happened. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's definitely true. I mean, um, governments think that spending on stadium is a vote winner. Uh, there's also a political economy that there are some groups who are vociferous, who it's important to um, in, in these cases, and then there are people it's not very important to. So there's clear redistribution there in, in terms of sports fans. Actually, the local media are always very pro these stadiums. You know, but, you know, why is that? Well, the Adelaide Advertiser, the back ten pages, the sports pages, you know, they want to have the, these in the state. So, I think there are the, these political economy reasons why, you know, governments um, think that they might be vote winners. I mean, that, that, that is really true. Why should they spend this money? You know, I think that's, that's a really big question. I mean, we see it in Australia, and we see it in, in Brazil, you know, the, the net cost to the government of hosting the World Cup was about $7 billion. You know, this is a middle-income country, there's a lot they could have done with it. They could also you know, have put on the World Cup for much less, but they're required to build brand new stadiums in order to be able to host it. So you know, that there are issues there of a monopoly power of the international organization. Yeah. But you know, there's clearly some monopoly is endemic in these team sports. 
Hey, uh, to me, it's part of a story. Okay, we have three questions <laughs> left, please. My question is partly related to that, and it's linked to the stadiums. What, why, in your view, and this is very topical here, as you why, in your view, are governments rushing to fund, or state governments rushing to fund sports stadiums, when I recall in the, I think it was the 1980s, when the VFL wanted a new stadium, they had a couple of the MCG, they developed their own, mm -hmm. way and pay for it themselves. Yeah. So what's happened between then and now to cause that sort of shift in who should pay? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Um, there was a boom in, in stadium building in the United States between 1980 and 2000, publicly funded stadiums. And I think that has some influence. You know, um, but I think what we also see that's, I think, peculiarly Australian is this interstate competition. So that what really triggered the big spending of the last decade was um, the Suncorp Stadium in Brisbane. I mean, that certainly influenced your South Australian government to say we've got to match that. And I think what happened in South Australia is certainly a bit behind what's happening here. But to me, what's also striking is that, I don't know the, the Western Australia debate as well as you probably do, but in, in South Australia, there was not real public discussion about it. You know, it just that the politicians obviously decided it was a, it was a vote winner was, we heard, and went ahead. And, this is $650 million, so, you know, four, four or five hundred dollars per resident of the state. I mean, they're not small amounts. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, Joe, there was a comment. Uh, I must say, I really do agree with you with regards to players and their, um, their salary and their earnings with regards to you know, how much the, the league gets. I think it's true of AFL. It's certainly true of uh, college football in America, where a lot of students, a lot of athletes, are actually playing for scholarships and get very little in the way of income, whereas all these kids get millions and not millions of dollars. Having regard to that, um, so if there's so much money in this sport, where are the entrepreneurs coming in and sort of trying to create new leagues and trying to create new sort of new competitions that would win that? Where is AFL Superman, for example? Uh, is it a question of risk? Or is it more that the stronghold of these leagues are so uh, so strong that actually can't again? Yeah, I think it's the second one. I mean, the, the, the incumbents have a huge advantage. We want to know who the national champion will be. The history in North America during the last century was many leagues challenging the, the incumbent leagues. The incumbents learned what you do is you make sure you're in maybe 14 of the 15 largest cities, and then it's very hard for a new league to come in. In Australia, we've had very, very few examples of that. You know, when um, Murdoch tried to challenge the rugby league, you know, that challenge lasted about one year um, and because it, it, there was too much confusion, um, audiences fell when there were t competing championships and so on. You know, it's, um, it hampered, it's probably more evident in boxing where you keep having you know, dual uh, competing things of who's the world champion. And it's very unpopular with the fans. So the incumbent leagues have a huge advantage. Then that gives them a monopoly power. You know, if you want to play AFL football and you want to be paid for it, you, know, you can work your way up through some of the, the junior levels, but there's only one elite league you can play in. And if the clubs agree on um, um, the conditions, you know, they can impose a lot of restrictions on, on the players. Um, so I think that, that inherent monopoly power is really, really important, which one would expect should say more about, well, well um, the governments should be... Oh, I don't really have the right, can't find the right side. Um, the government should be spending time, you know, looking at this abuse of monopoly power. That's not what they do. You know, what the governments are doing is subsidising the, the sport. I think, mean, just very, very briefly, college football is a bit different because you can think of that as people not being paid but um, doing an apprenticeship and the hope they'll get a big salary later. Whereas here in the AFL, this is your lifetime earnings that are, are regulated. Yes, Alex. <laughs> Alex from the Federation of Glasgow Celtics. Tell by your Two of the stars of Team Ola, one was him and someone who played him. Both have been recruited by Spanish clubs, Barcelona and Real Madrid. I watch the European Champions League. It always ends up with the same champions. And so even though we've got competition, it's almost the better competition. It's always the Super League competing, uh, both in Europe, European Champions League and up in the English 
So why would we say, why would the economists say, oh, the English Football League is very competitive? And probably could say the same thing about the European League. It's competitive for its a perverted form of competition, isn't it? It's always the super elite clubs that will take home the trophy. No. Um, I mean, the European um, champions have come from different countries in recent years. There's been a succession of different... Uh, I mean, there's a, a small pool from which it would come. There's a small pool of teams from which the AFL champions will come. It's the, the whatever, 18 teams that are in the league. Um, in the English league, yeah, the teams from the big cities have more money. But you can have a small town team. A team from Blackburn won the English Premier League in the, in the 1990s. That's the 50th biggest town in in England. You can't have that in Australia. The 50th busy, biggest city doesn't win the Premiership in the AFL because they're not allowed to play. Well, Blackburn for all was one because they had a country where there was tons of money in it. So for that yeah. team, they actually won the English Premiership. Yeah. But in the European Championship, you look at the actual winners over the last 20 years, you find it's more and more concentrated amongst uh, uh, 10 football clubs. A 10's pretty big, isn't it? <laughs> but it's got a nice uh, yeah. <laughs> Next. Sorry. I'll talk later. <laughs> uh, uh, oh. I just wondered, um, on, on this uh, you know, justifying um, public investment in stadiums, is there a qualitative difference between, between this sort of stadium competition between states and, say, the competition uh, to build art galleries in the 19th century? Or, or you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't yeah. expect, expect the, the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra to pay for the, uh, the festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so they're both providing a public good and arguably some comfortable benefit. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, yeah, I'd say, I mean, we, all of the estimates we have is that the justification in terms of jobs created and income generated, yeah, that doesn't work as an explanation. Um, what amazes me in Adelaide is how many people who even have no interest in sport are very proud of the new stadium. Um, so that there is a, a feel good element there. Yeah. One other thing I didn't mention that I would mention is, you know, what, what is the feature of these new stadiums? You know, the average um, stadium in America costs about $300 million to build in, in the last decade. Here it costs 600 and going up. You know, one of the features at Adelaide is you know, the executive boxes. You know, so it's in terms of fairness for the sports fans, but what's really been upgraded you know, compared to the old facilities is better facilities for the rich people, which I think, again, is a... A, a bit of feature and people who are in Saka. We're running out of time. We have two very quick comments by Tinder and then by Greg. Yes, sir. 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 Yes